and the media past president, Cantona. Uh, while we meet here today on a virtual platform, I want to begin by acknowledging the importance of the lands on which we each call home. I'm personally speaking on the ancestral lands of the Sacken Fox, the Iowa, and the Oto Missourian. I honor and give thanks to these indigenous communities and the indigenous communities on whose ancestral lands you're each located. Now, the purpose of these sessions is to provide updates about what's taking place on NCA and to address questions that you might have about the association. It's also a tremendous opportunity for us to gather suggestions about ongoing and developing initiatives. Now, since this is the first one, there might be some issues and hiccups along the way as we manage format and technology, but hopefully this will be a worthwhile and productive experience. Now, I do want to reinforce that the expectations for communication are being guided by the NCA credo for ethical communication. Now, of particular importance here are striving to understand and respect communicators and promoting care and mutual understanding for one another. And there'll be absolutely no tolerance for communication that degrades uh, through distortion, intimidation, coercion, and violence, or through the expression of intolerance and hatred. Now, this will go this way. We'll begin by talking about the upcoming convention, and then we'll answer any questions you might have about the convention. Then we'll address other initiatives and end the day by answering questions you might have about those initiatives and other matters related to the association and by engaging in general conversation. And with that, I want to turn things over to Roseanne Manzik, who will provide us with a convention update. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. It's, well, it's morning here in Texas. I'm not sure what time it is where you are. Um, and I'm so happy to see all of you here today. And um, it's such a privilege to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Uh, so as you may know, uh, the second vice president plans the convention for that particular year. And so it's my privilege um, and my great opportunity to be the principal planner for the 21, 2021 convention in Seattle. And the theme there is renewal and transformation. And so um, I wanted to give you an overview of some of the uh, where we are in the decision making process, um, for that convention, give you a few highlights um, about submissions and some of the key programs. Talk a little bit about um, the potential for, um, you know, having some kind of a continuation of some virtual sessions and what those might be. Um, and then, of course, answer any questions that you have. So to kind of give you a big overview here, uh, just in terms of number of submissions, let me start with that. We actually had uh, just under 3,500 submissions for this year's convention, for the 2021 convention. And that aligns pretty closely with what the submissions were for the 2020 convention, originally scheduled for Indianapolis. Um, comparing that to some past conventions, um, recently we had 3,800 submissions in Baltimore and 4,100 submissions for Salt Lake. So we're not down that much in terms of the submissions. And one of the interesting things to take into consideration is um, that for this particular location in Seattle, we actually had less convention slots available. So we really only, we had uh, about 990 slots versus 1,200 that we had available in Salt Lake. So that always differs depending on the location that we're in and then um, how many uh, submitters we can accommodate. So I think when you take that into consideration, um, it's a pr pretty positive picture that there were a lot of folks who were able to submit and interested in um, the prospects of a return to a face-to-face -face convention. And of course, I'll talk in a minute, of course, that we know that there were people that couldn't submit um, for a variety of reasons, and that may have been budget cuts, and that may have been um, you know, state guidelines that may have been health concerns that continue. And so, you know, we, we will be considering when the executive committee meets in June, uh, whether um, to make uh, potential changes to the schedule, how much we can do, uh, but we're really interested in trying to see if we can embrace um, the face-to-face -face format again, um, taking into, into consideration a lot of those feelings and concerns. 
I wanted to highlight for you a little bit, just a few of the things that I have planned for 2021. And then of course, answer um, questions that you have. So under the theme of renewal and transformation, um, I'm excited to talk about very briefly four spotlight programs uh, that I'm going, that I've asked folks to plan for me. Um, and I'm, they are the four Ds. Uh, the first is democracy. Uh, the second is dissent. The third is discipline. And the fourth is disruption. And so um, we're going to be kind of looking at the whole uh, scenario of uh, democracy being uh, the January 6th events um, and a very innovative format there with a documentary film that's going to be screened and then the scholars who are interviewed in that film being a part of the panel. Um, we're going to have dissent that's going to include some of the local activists from the Seattle area. Discipline is going to look at our um, renewing and then also what needs to be transformed in terms of our disciplinary commitments and credos and goals that we've made around uh, many issues. And dis uh, the disruption is about uh, what we all experienced in our teaching and in our scholarship um, in, in the face of the pandemic. We also have an opening session that is going to be featuring um, an all indigenous people panel um, talking about cultural and um, societal issues there um, and including people from the Seattle area. And we also, um, I'm happy to sponsor an alt academic panel about um, alternative careers for communication scholars and students, and also a panel about the uh, recent upswing, um, uh, unfortunately, of violence against Asian Americans. Um, other things that will be highlighted, of course, will be panels, um, one honoring uh, the legacy of our former president, Judy Trent, who passed away this year, another honoring um, and talk and featuring uh, many of our past presidents. So it's kind of an overview of many things to expect. Uh, the last thing I'll preview is our Arnold Scholar, this Carol C. Arnold lecturer this year will be Dr. Tina Harris from um, Louisiana State University. So um, back to the decision-making process, and then we'll open this for questions. Um, one of the things I, that I invite you to think about, of course, we had a very successful um, shift to a virtual format um, in 2021 um, and worked very, very hard, um, thanks to David's efforts and the efforts of the national office to be able to pull that off and to include um, as many, uh, I think we had, David can tell us for sure, we had, I think, up to upward of 600 programs that were done live and virtually, and then the remainder with um, papers uploaded and, uh, and that, that content available. As we look at this coming year, and there's lots of considerations um, that the executive committee is, is, is really aware of and, and needs to kind of strike a balance of. And one, of course, is the, um, the notion that there are structural barriers to trying to envision, even though it may seem simple, um, to envision any kind of a hybrid conference because our convention sites don't have the bandwidth to be able to have 50 sessions going on at the same time where everyone is uploading things and everyone's on their cell phones. I think the conventions in the future very well might be like that. Um, but we're also constrained not only by that structural barrier, but also by um, contracts. Um, the NCA contracts um, our convention six years out in advance. Um, so that's why you can look at our website and see where we're going for the next six years. Uh, and so I think as, we, as the, as the um, executive committee continues to look at, our goal is to really um, take all those considerations we're, we are planning on the face-to-face -face convention, but we're also hoping to be able to look at lots of opportunities for um, uh, programs in additional to the ones that we usually do that are available virtually. We usually do the awards, we usually do the opening session, we usually do the Arnold lecture. Um, and so we're gonna continue to talk about um, expanding that access. Um, and, and, you know, uh, when we meet in June, we'll take all of these um, issues 
into our conversation. So, um, so I think I'm going to stop my overview there, uh, just to give you uh, some highlights about the convention and to give you a sense of the bigger picture. And then I'm happy to answer questions um, about that you have about the convention um, and about the format and concerns that you have. So, and I think Waleed, you are monitoring this for us. So. Thanks, Roseanne. Yeah, we'll give it a shot. Um, like as, like um, David said, it's a work in progress. And, and you may be able to see the comment, um, Roseanne, that was posted or not. But first of all, I did want to, um, but I'll read it just in case. I wanted to um, note my our enthusiasm for the fact that there are um, 45 uh, folks who in attendance. That's really exciting for us. And, and so thanks for being here. Um, so Roseanne, uh, the Megan uh, Powers notes, I'm an alt Com communications professional who hasn't yet gone into teaching. I own a strategic marketing communications agency. Is there still an opportunity to sit on the alt academic panel? Question mark. My main verticals have also been hospitality, restaurants, and meetings and events, which were both very disrupted by the pandemic. So the broader question is, how can folks be involved in the alt alt ac panel that you um, that you reference? Well, I'm I'm not personally planning that. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank right now about the person that is planning it that contacted me. Um, but uh, that panel, I hope, I'm hoping, um, and I'm going to be advocating that that will be one that will be one of the ones that we can make available um, that we can stream uh, because I know there's a large amount of interest. So that even though if you're not on the panel and if you're not in Seattle um, and at the conference um, yourself you still will be able to access that content. And, and very much, um, we will certainly would be recording that session. Um, so uh, Megan, I'm gonna make a note of your name and I will certainly um, contact the person who is planning that program and see, um, you know, we're, we're in the stage right now where the submissions have gone in and the deadline was March 31st and the program planners now are constructing the panels and all of that comes back to the national office and to me at the beginning of May. So we're right in the middle of when things are being finalized right now. So, but, but thank you for that comment and for that question. Thanks, Roseanne. And Megan, if you wanted to uh, on chat, private chat, Roseanne, your email, that also might be helpful. Um, and I guess I should, I should clarify that Alt-Ac, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, alternative academic. So folks who may not, you know, after their um, graduate program may not, may decide to go into uh, options outside of academia um, as a, for, for careers or, or jobs. Um, okay, uh, Tim uh, Gibson, um, go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, I have a question about uh, for the executive committee about the future of publishing um, at NCA and particularly uh, NCA's relationship to Taylor and Francis. Like other publishers, you know, Taylor and Francis generates massive profit margins in the range of 30%. And they do this largely by exploiting the unpaid labor of faculty and graduate students who write articles and who serve as reviewers and editors. Uh, and then um, these publishers like Taylor and Francis lock our work behind paywalls. Uh, my personal view is that faculty need to take back control of academic publishing for the public good. And so my question is, would NCA leadership consider moving out of its relationship with Taylor and Francis and charge a committee to explore moving to a model of open access, non-commercial publishing controlled by faculty? Thanks a lot, Tim, for that question. So I guess I should have been more clear in terms of uh, when, when Rick, to you, we're going to have an open um, time at the end. And so now that you're, you've mentioned that, that'll be the first question that we take on uh, once we've, we're done with the uh, reports. Um, so thanks a lot for that comment. We'll come back to that issue and um, after the, as the first issue to discuss once we're done with the various reports. Um, so for now, we're going to be um, focusing specifically on the convention for another about 12 minutes, um, but Tim will definitely address that. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, and I do see a, a question about attendance and caps on attendance per session. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, thanks for that question, Anna. I think that is definitely the kind of thing um, as the executive committee, I mean, you have the four officers here today, but you don't have the full executive committee, um, which includes all of the, the chairs of the various councils. 
um, as well as all three members of the finance board. Um, and so that's a larger group that is the decision-making body. Um, so uh, the officers right now, um, I you know, want to address some of these questions, but um, I think the decision about caps on attendance is something we'll make um, in, co in collaboration with our um, NCA staff person who's a conventions professional um, named Kristen Yednock, who's the one that kind of handles all of the logistics with the convention sites. And, um, and of course, because of the um, situation with the ongo ongoing pandemic, uh, typically by now, I would have been um, along with Kristen and probably with, uh, with Trevor, um, our executive director, would have gone on site personally to look at the convention facilities and to walk through the various rooms. Um, and we have not been able to do that. We've not yet had that site visit. And so we did a virtual site visit um, back in, Jan in early January. Um, so got to look a little bit at the rooms in the convention center, which is our primary location and the Sheraton Hotel next door, which is the secondary location. Uh, but I think you ask a good question about um, attendance and caps. And I think that that will be something that we'll really have to talk with Kristen about and coordinate with the facilities and that kind of thing, I think, is going to be um, that picture will become clearer, I think, after we talk in June and as we look into the fall um, about what the uh, best practices are that similar conventions and similar groups are doing. And I just I don't think we really have a, a sense for that all yet, but I think it's an important question for us to be thinking about. So thank you. And just to add really quickly, some of those uh, decisions will be based on CDC guidelines at the time and guidelines uh, for Seattle. So it's always kind of a work in progress. The last year we were planning the convention originally, of course, it was face to face. Then we were going to go to hybrid and then eventually virtual. But each time we were kind of uh, relying on those CDC guidelines as we made those decisions. Um, thanks all for these questions. And now they're coming in uh, more, uh, more so fantastic. We have, let's see, um, and, I, and I wanted to also note that we are, we will continue to update um, and maybe even try to do better than, you know, as, 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 as well as we can in terms of update, in terms of uh, changes that we make on these questions, because I know they're really important to people's decisions about going to the conference and other things. So we'll, uh, we're committed to really, um, to keeping everyone updated as soon as we have information. Um, let's see, I think the next question is from um, Spoma Jovanovic. Uh, will virtual attendance require the same registration fees as in-person attendance? Do we need to coordinate virtual attendance with technology requests? Um, and then a related question from Kendra Knight, is legislative uh, assembly under consideration for virtual participation? Okay, well, let, let me address that and then I'm going to let the other officers chime in, uh, particularly about the Legislative Assembly, because that's that's David's purview um, this year. Uh, but in terms of, I, I just want to make sure that I, um, I'm clear, uh, we are not going to have a virtual convention this year. Right. So um, the at least unless the executive committee decides differently. But what we are going to try to do in answer to your question, uh, Spoma, is to try to expand the amount of things that we have available virtually. And I think when the executive committee meets in June, what we're really going to have to do is make some decisions. Um, right now, we don't have we haven't really talked about. Um, registration fees. Uh, in the past, the content that's been made uh, available virtually, again, it's been the awards, it's been the Arnold lecture, it's been, I think, the opening session, um, though there has been no charge for those. Um, so whether we, um, in consultation with our finance committee, come up with um, a plan for a staggered kind of fee, I, I don't know. Um, I don't think that that's not the decision of the four officers. Again, it's an executive committee decision that's really made in consultation with a lot of the factors in terms of what's technologically possible at the site. Um, but it but I, I'm, I, I can be almost certain that it's not going to duplicate what we had last year um, in terms of the entire convention being available virtually. So I wanna make sure that I didn't you know, provide a misinterpretation. What we're really hoping is to expand 
some of the things that are happening at the convention and make those available virtually, but it's not, I don't think the chances for it to be a full on virtual experience um, are possible again because of the kind of limitations we have with the site itself um, that uh, until convention sites change and hotels change there's just not the technology the bandwidth the cameras the labor on site to be able to develop to deliver a convention with people there in the room as well as people at a distance and to make that work in any kind of professionally um, and and you know uh, uh, you know feasible way right now so so I hope that answers your question I think there's the the it, it, it's sort of more to come <laughs> I think once the executive committee meets in in June but David do you want to talk about LA the follow up just quickly with David, the follow up from SCOMA was um, thank you, that's helpful to know. Attendees cannot virtually attend, uh, cannot attend virtually on a panel, right? Question mark. At, yeah, at this point, we have not created that kind of uh, possibility. But, you know, I mean, I, I think that as we talk about when we meet in June, um, you know, that will be one of the questions under consideration. But I don't believe that that's going to be the case. Just again, for the technological issues um, involved and and the labor, um, you know, we have some some cameras and some video projectors and right and some capacity. But to be able to deliver that kind of hybrid format, I think, is a ways down the road when our convention centers and when our hotels catch up with. Um, I think what that future is going to look like. So thanks. Yeah. In terms of the legislative assembly, we haven't decided yet, uh, but it sure worked out well last year. And, uh, you know, Kent did a marvelous job. I'm going to hate uh, having to follow him. But uh, there are certain benefits to meeting virtually. And the first and foremost being people on the legislative assembly don't have to pay for another hotel night. And so there are a lot of advantages uh, to do so. And so haven't decided yet, uh, and uh, that will probably be announced in June, would be my guess. So those are, those are the, um, the questions as far as I can tell. Uh, we, only, we only have about two more minutes anyway on this issue, but um, I think, unless someone else wants to jump on immediately, I think we're ready to go to the next stage. Okay, great. Thanks. So um, thanks, Roseanne. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so the next um, sort of set of updates are, are a series of brief updates um, that we'll give, and then we'll take questions sort of at the end of the brief update. So there's about maybe, I don't know, 15 or so minutes or 20 minutes of, of several brief updates about things. And then that's that's the extent of our sort of prepared presentations. And so then it's really open to questions. And like I said, we'll um, start with with Tim's after that. But as you have questions come up during our presentations, by all means, um, you know, again, include the questions or comments on the chat, and we'll we'll get to them. So we're going to start off with um, Kent is going to give us a really brief update about the, uh, uh, the statement um, that we made about uh, anti-Asian violence. Hey everyone, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for coming, um, and I hope uh, this is is useful to you uh, in your professional lives in your lives. Um, I'm just going to give a brief update about the the statement that we wrote about anti-Asian uh, violence. Uh, for those of you who might not have checked all of your uh, social media sites and email uh, accounts. Um, essentially, uh, last Friday, uh, our statement, the officer's statement went out, um, you, know, uh, you know, arguing against um, anti-Asian violence, obviously, uh, but also talking a lot about the different things that NCA has been doing uh, since the pandemic began on the subject of anti-Asian violence, but also uh, committing to doing several uh, additional things as well um, to, to, to address um, this pernicious um, uh, 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 phenomenon. So I just wanted to highlight, I mean, you're welcome to read it. So it, it went out on Facebook, it went out on Twitter. I don't know about Instagram, um, but for sure it went out by email um, this morning. Um, the I wanted to highlight 
some of the things that that we're actually you know doing specifically to to try to address this ongoing um, issue, this ongoing travesty. So um, as Roseanne mentioned, and thank you very much, Roseanne, there will be a first vice presidential um, NCA uh, convention panel on anti-Asian violence. So that's one thing that we're doing. We're also planning to host an NCA convention panel on bystander training pedagogy. Um, so uh, we're hoping to get uh, smart people who've done bystander training uh, it, you know, uh, to talk to us about how that's done and, and how that can be um, uh, utilized in face-to-face -face, uh, situations and online. And we're going to host a workshop for journalists uh, who are covering stories about, um, about Asian people, but also specifically about anti-Asian violence. So we're not sure yet precisely what the panel will look like, whether it will be a, a, a kind of virtual panel that will be accessible to journalists across the country or world. Um, or whether it will be just an on-site, um, uh, just an on-site panel, um, and then addition. In addition to that, uh, we're going to continue to foreground the central role that that um, our research uh, among scholars in the association uh, have been doing on the subject, and uh, want to work closely with the Asian Pacific American Caucus and the uh, additional um, uh, Asian Pacific American Studies Division on any joint programming that we can do and any other uh, joint efforts we can do uh, to work together on the issue. Um, and, and I think that, that that's the brief summary. Thanks, Kent. And I just wanted to say that one of the things that I know we've had several conversations about is as we sort of ramp up the statements, um, the public statements that NCA is making, um, to really increasingly find ways to tie it to either actions we've already taken and or actions that we plan to take so that we're not just making statements without actually follow up action tied to those commitments. And so that's something that you'll see probably increasingly as we try to figure out the best way to do this with the executive committee and um, at the national office. Um, the next set of um, brief reports is on task forces and I'm going to post the um, uh, let's see here, the, the order and who's presenting um, which. So we're going to start with the Mentorship Task Force, uh, Kent. Uh, yeah, so it's me again. <laughs> um, a couple of years back, I initiated a Mentorship Task Force, uh, which worked really hard under the leadership of Michael Lechuga. Some of you were on that task force, so thank you very much for um, your service uh, to NCA and to the committee. But uh, there was a wonderful report uh, produced by that committee that the executive committee uh, reviewed uh, over three different meetings uh, to decide uh, what we could do in terms of action steps to address uh, the task force. And so the mentorship task force, um, one of the things that it, it, it asked for was uh, central leadership. Uh, it had a lot of other things that we need to do as an association. Um, NCA has done very well in mentorship over, over many, many years, but there's been no like coordinated, centralized, um, uh, consolidated uh, effort to, to bring all of the mentorship uh, activities together and to um, build it out. Uh, and so what we did was uh, discuss the idea of creating a mentorship council. It was at that time that Roseanne Manziak um, uh, what had expressed the need for stronger leadership support by NCA. And so Roseanne and I put our heads together, uh, came up with a proposal to create a council of mentorship and leadership. So it's the Mentorship and Leadership Council. And we proposed that to the executive committee. The executive committee uh, resoundingly uh, supported that. So that is ready to be approved at the next legislative assembly meeting in November. And I hope for those of you who are serving uh, as uh, legislators, uh, we'll, I hope you'll be at that meeting and that, that you will support uh, the council. I think it's an exciting thing that NCA is doing to uh, increase the attention and effort toward mentorship and leadership uh, to, to highlight even more that aspect of uh, the association and its cap capacity uh, for improving it.
Okay, well, I guess I am next. Um, so uh, back to me. Um, it's my great um, honor and privilege to um, have had the responsibility and the opportunity to name the, um, the next tax force, task force, which is the IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access Strategic Plan Task Force for NCA. And so very briefly, this group has been charged with um, coming up with a comprehensive strategic plan for our association for those four aspects. Um, it's uh, an effort that's been a long time coming. We've had cauc our caucuses have been working on these issues for a long time. Um, several of you know uh, initiatives have come forth from the national office and from the executive committee, including a series of new awards, including a state a change in the distinguished scholar selection process. Some of the things that you've seen happen in the last few years. Uh, but the time is now for a, comp a comprehensive plan. And so that task force has been named. Um, they have uh, been working already and the effort is underway. And I'm planning soon, we've had a little bit of a change in the leadership. So um, in the next few days, I'm going to post an update um, to ComNotes about the membership that is co-chaired by uh, Rachel Griffin, who's the current chair of our diversity council from um, the University of Utah and Ashley Mack, who is uh, the representative to the Diversity Council from the Women's Caucus um, and who's from uh, Louisiana State University. So I'm um, really, really looking for great things to come from that task force. And um, the process will be that they've been charged with coming up with the plan um, by uh, next January in time for the executive committee to consider the plan um, and their report. And then from there, it would go forward through the process to um, uh, consideration by the Legislative Assembly for adoption by the association. So you'll be hearing more about the progress of that task force um, in, you know, in the coming months. So. All right, well, I'm next uh, with my two uh, task force currently in uh, process. One is the uh, Mental Health and Communication Task Force. Uh, this isn't necessarily my own research, but it's an area that I thought was really, really important. Uh, an area that uh, we as communication scholars could work on a little bit more and have some uh, good things to say. Uh, for example, how might the communication discipline expand research on mental health? Uh, how might NCA assist on doing that? And what health concerns are especially vital to students and faculty members? Al Brian Gruy of the University of Denver and Leah Surer, who's at the uh, University of South Dakota, are co-chairing the task force. And you may have seen in com notes uh, the other day that we're uh, in the process of gathering members and they will begin their, uh, their work next month and hopefully should have everything completed by August 22nd. Then the other one that I am working on is the qualitative research, probably not as important for our, uh, our health or, or justice concerns, but focused on research. Uh, it seems like there is uh, less of a, uh, a, an understanding of qualitative research. And so this group that's being chaired by uh, Jimmy Manning is uh, generating an agenda for supporting uh, qualitative research development in the disciplines. Uh, they're in the process of creating a set of guidelines for reviewing qualitative scholarship, uh, best practices for teaching qualitative methods and methodology, and how qualitative inquiry fits into newer initiatives in the academy, uh, like open data, and then creating conference opportunities to promote growth and development and connections for qualitative researchers, and those are set to, uh, they're set to finish their work in July of next year. I just wanted to know, David, I posted the call um, for applications um, uh, for the Mental Health and Communication Task Force in the chat. So anyone interested in looking at that more carefully, there's it's April 30th, it's the deadline, I believe, for application. Um, so, um, yeah. Good. Thanks, Wally. Uh, 
I guess that's me. That's uh, I'm next. Um, so being moderator and, and, and a participant is uh, challenging at times. Okay, so um, this is uh, the the last task force we're going to discuss is is very much a, a work in progress. Uh, Roseanne and I are working together to finalize some of the details, to put together the call, etc. But um, and this is going to work closely with folks in the national office who have had a, a long experience and quite a bit of data on the convention. Uh, but the idea is that we recognize that you know this um, the virtual conference last year um, really revealed some things that um, we should really consider adopting moving forward, um, and I think created opportunities for greater inclusivity that we may not have seen prior or imagined prior or thought of prior. And so we really need to sort of have a comprehensive look that both um, examines various models, uh, which again, national office has done a lot of this, but just sort of putting everyone in one place with one mission and task. Um, uh, look at the, the financial implications, but also look at sort of the best practices approach and what's possible and what's not possible. As Roseanne is saying, some of this is going to take some time for, frankly, our spaces to come up to speed with the, the amount of Wi-Fi that would be needed to make it fully virtual, the amount of labor that would be needed to, to, to for uh, have camera, you know, cameras and all that. So there's a lot of logistical parts um, that aren't quite caught up with the interest in doing this sort of immediate shift to a virtual, um, which is why sort of we're imagining what we can do for, you know, as Roseanne talked about this upcoming immediate conference, and then what can we think of from a longer term standpoint of the kinds of changes we're making? We already have commitments for six years, as Roseanne noted. Um, and so some of these will require rethinking, maybe renegotiating, et cetera. But what we need to have first is a set of options that are tied to um, you know, uh, financial implications that then are considered throughout the NCA system and ultimately leading to what we hope to be conferences that um, are virtual, much more virtual than, uh, you know, hybrid, sorry, much more hybrid than was the case pre-COVID, right? And um, that'll take some time, uh, both for technology to catch up with uh, and resources to catch up and to make sure the task force has an opportunity to consider these options, to then present them to the executive committee, LA, et cetera, et cetera, to go through the process. But just wanted to alert everyone that this is something that we're doing, that we're very serious about, that we recognize, and that we want to ultimately get to a place where we have a con uh, convention that uh, best sort of takes the best of what we learned and keeps the best of what's face to face. Um, or is there anything else to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add that I think on this particular task force, um, I would hope that there would be a, a great deal of opportunities for member input. Um, as I think that all of us come from different places with different needs in terms and different preferences about what do we want our annual convention to look like? What does it do? What purposes does it serve? Um, what, you know, as Waleed said, what lessons can we take from what we successfully did in 2020 in, you know, the, the, in the midst of the circumstances, but also in a planful way, think about what are advantages and disadvantages and what, what, be, what best meets um, members' needs about um, the conventions of the future. So yeah, so lots to talk about with that one. But I hope that when those opportunities arise, that you'll all let us know what you think and what you want and what you need um, and what you would like to see happen. Thanks, Roseanne. And um, I'm hearing of the distortion and breakup. So sorry for technological hiccups. Um, I tried to make an adjustment. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, uh, the last thing we're going to be giving a brief report on is um, I, I, I'm, I'm ending it up with the sort of the, we have an initiative um, for greater transparency and greater communication uh, or improved communication. So there's a lot that happens at NCA that I think, think folks don't know about that if they knew about, um, they might think differently about some of the things that are going on. Um, but also there's opportunities to become be more transparent in our processes and our meetings, et cetera. And so this is more of a heads up that um, this is just part, this kind of uh, event and hopefully on an ongoing basis is part of that. Um, but we're rethinking lots of our uh, processes uh, and, and with that general initiative in mind. Um, there's gonna be included, for example, I know task forces, there's been some frustration that um, you know, folks don't know what happened to task force, what they produce, what the, and a lot of things, a lot of things have come out of those task forces, but um, sometimes they're not fully communicated. 
Um, and so we're, we're creating a separate website for each web page for each um, task force that lists, you know, gives a history of them. We're doing lots of things tied to um, and, and thinking of various things that we can do to update members um, whenever, you know, meetings occur, et cetera, and to provide access uh, as much as possible to um, meetings, for example, the, you know, uh, uh, legislative assembly has always been a, a public meeting, an open meeting, but it always hadn't necessarily been advertised or it hasn't been, uh, you know, recorded and, and uh, uh, streamed, live streams, et cetera. So these are all things that we're thinking about and working towards. And if you have ideas uh, towards that, we absolutely welcome them at any time. Um, but just wanted to let you know that's something that's going on. And that kind of wraps up um, our plans, sort of updates. Um, I'm really glad because that leaves us with 30 plus minutes for, um, for Q&A. Um, and so let's see here. We, we uh, said, with, we told Tim we'd start with his, so we will. And then there's other questions that have emerged um, on the, um, on the, uh, the chat that I, what we'll keep track of. So um, Roseanne, Kent, or David, do you wanna speak to um, Tim's question about publishing? Because I'm probably the least qualified among you all to, to speak to that. Yeah, and just while you're deciding, I just want to apologize to Roseanne. Sorry, I came in hot with something that wasn't <laughs> wasn't pertinent to what you were talking about. <laughs> and could you? Uh, and that's no problem at all, Ken uh, or Tim. I was uh, going to say, could you uh, repeat your question one more time, just to make sure everybody remembers? Uh, and then I think Kent may respond. Not to put yeah. him on the spot, but I saw he unmuted himself. Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know. NCA has had this relationship with Taylor and Francis for uh, many years now. And, um, you know, Taylor and Francis, like a lot of one of the larger publishers, academic publishers, and like a lot of the big ones like Elsevier and, and Springer and others, they, you know, generate huge profit margins. And there's, it's not really one source of those profit margins comes from the unpaid labor of faculty uh, and graduate students who, you know, do the research, write the articles, um, you know, uh, uncompensated except by their institutions, certainly not compensated by Taylor and Francis, and then serve, you know, gratis as reviewers and editors. Um, and then our work gets locked behind paywalls, so, uh, which reduces its impact. So, you know, I personally believe that we need to take back control of academic publishing from these large commercial publishers. And so I wanted to kind of start or continue, I'm sure this has been brought up before, um, the conversation about moving away from a relationship with Taylor and Francis and perhaps charging a committee to explore alternative models for publishing um, in communication in the field, uh, you know, that are open access, non-commercial, basically. So just wondering if there's a committee or, or someone working on this. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'll take a shot at the at the question. Um, I think you you may know uh, for sure. Some people in the room uh, in the Zoom know that we, um, as an association, used to publish in house uh, using NC NCA was the publisher of record, and um, that was interesting and and worked very well for a long period of time um, until it didn't. And so it, it was really at that, at, and I should say that at that time, uh, also uh, reviewers and uh, writers were uncompensated, right? So, so this has been an uncompensated uh, kind of relationship for a very long time. And so I appreciate your bringing it out. Um, but at, at, at a certain point, it became untenable for the association just because we were becoming a publishing house um, and the number of journals that we had, the number of submissions we had, all of those things increased significantly over time. And that's uh, when we appealed to um, uh, an outside vendor uh, to facilitate, help us uh, to do that. One of the things that many people don't know is that NCA, one, more than one third of NCA's budget comes from um, uh, the fund funds that come from Taylor and Francis. So while it is true that um, authors and reviewers are not directly compensated, 
um, NCA as a professional organization if, if people think of it as supporting uh, the membership does provide uh, benefits through the association as a result of that relationship. Uh, that doesn't uh, diminish in any way your point that Taylor and Francis are, is making money. Uh, they absolutely certainly are, um, and they they certainly you know are are um, a, a corporation. And so um, when NCA went into the relationship with uh, Taylor and Francis, there was extensive extensive conversation top to bottom of the association uh, in making that decision. Um, that said. We do have a publications uh, council, and that's the place to go with this issue. Uh, they do uh, consider open source publishing on a regular basis, annually, that is. And people often do bring it up, uh, both individuals who are submitting essays who want their essay to be open uh, access, and also um, you know, uh, people who want the association to change in relationship to it. But that's where one would go to, to kind of um, have a conversation with them and they do deliberate. So that is a deliberative body. They do take every kind of issue that comes up like that uh, very seriously and, and, and work through it. Uh, but that's kind of where anything that might happen to change uh, would start. So I, I think it's a lot longer conversation. So I don't want to get into the conversation here, but, um, but I think that if you do approach them, um, uh, there's a possibility uh, that you could kind of work with them to kind of see what the possibilities are. Thank you. That's, that's an extremely helpful answer. I appreciate it very much. Um, in the chat, I'm just going to share some information with the group about, um, I'm, I'm serving on a committee at our library um, at Mason, where we're currently renegotiating our contract with Elsevier. Um, and so our librarians, uh, you know, as you know, if you've ever met a librarian, they are tenacious and brilliant and uh, uh, and don't cross the librarians because they'll come for you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> anyway, more seriously, they've developed a really good resource in terms of learning about um, academic publishing and the role of these big publishers um, and some of the um, kind of exploitative relationships they have. So and and, you know, some of the institutions that are pushing back against them as well. So um, yeah, I'll just share that out if anyone's curious, but thank you uh, for, for that answer. I really appreciate it, Ken. I also really appreciate the, um, the, the, the comments in the chat, uh, sort of adding up, adding this conversation and we'll save the chat and make sure to um, share it with the national office in, um, in, in, in hopes of, of uh, you know, adding that, that conversation this is a really important question. Um, so thank you. Um, let's see. I'm gonna uh, sort of back up to make sure I didn't I didn't uh, miss anything. There was a couple. Of, there's one I I know from Michelle kind of um, Volanti Violanti about um, actually two two really related ideas, Roseanne, that you that maybe um, you're wanting to address. One is about this, the the fact that so many divisions are doing their own things related to, and in fact, you know, as we went through, as I went through to to almost all the division meetings uh, during the election, I was uh, noticing this and the, the tremendous amount of work that's being done on, on the divisional level. And the question is, um, of course, it typically falls on a number of people who receive little or no credit, as Michelle says, on their campus for that effort. Could you talk a little bit about what executive committee might be planning to help units minimize duplicative work and best practices sharing? So I'm guessing that's gonna be something that the task force may be adopting, but I don't know if that, it, I'd love your thoughts on that. Um, and the other related question was, um, and Ambar, I'll get to yours after this, but I want talking about inclusivity commitment to anti-discriminatory practices. We don't see many job calls that support research teaching in that area. Is it within the scope of the IDEA committee to take up this issue? That is possibly one way of providing structures for offering support to minority issues in academia. Any thoughts, Roseanne? Yeah, uh, those are both great questions. And um, to Michelle's first, I think that is um, exactly the kind of, so we, we've seen those efforts um, a lot of at the division level, at the interest group level, at the caucus level to address, um, you know, inclusion, diversity, equity, access issues. But, um, but that's exactly why the time is now for um, the strategic plan for the association, right? That would look at 
how those ongoing efforts are, are you know, would, would give structure, I would, let me say it that way, to those ongoing efforts and would give a coordination that we currently don't have. Um, because again, um, kind of as, as Kent mentioned earlier with the mentorship and the leadership development, for a long time, um, especially our caucuses and some of the divisions were doing that, uh, but we didn't have a place that that really had support um, or a place where all of those efforts came together. So in the same sense that we have in answer to Tim's question, the publication council, well, hopefully in the future, if the uh, legislative assembly approves that, we'll have a mentorship leadership development council that would then be a way to coordinate all those kinds of efforts. So I think the same idea um, as the task force uh, looks at what, what should be in the strategic plan for inclusion, diversity, equity, and access for the association, it would be potentially giving a place to coordinate those efforts that individually the divisions and the interest groups and the caucuses have been undertaking. Um, so it's not so much the, you know, eventually that might bubble up to the executive committee, but I think the initiative to have the strategic plan task force came out of the conversations from the executive committee and what we were hearing from members certainly over the past several years. Um, I'm not so sure about the second question. I think it's a really important one about um, the job calls. And I don't know that the task force itself will look at that because we're the task force is going to be looking at a strategic plan for the association and for NCA's practices and, um, and structures. But, um, but I think that's an interesting point that I'll convey back to them in terms of, um, you know, maybe that's a, a different kind of initiative for us to look at um, what is happening with our position announcements and um, how to encourage, because those come from individual institutions, how to en encourage um, additional uh, attention to idea issues there as well. But I think that's a that's a great piece of feedback that I'm gonna give back to um, the task force that's working on the strategic plan. So I hope that answers both questions. Thanks, Roseanne. And I just wanted to, I guess, um, remind everyone that there's sort of two, because sometimes I, you know, I, get, I sort of can get confused. There's two sort of um, units here. One is the idea council. Um, and so questions or concerns about idea related issues could be sent to the idea council. Um, and Rachel Griffin is the chair of that council. And then there's the Roseanne's um, idea strategic um, uh, mission, uh, strategic plan um, task force, which has, a, very, has a, 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 a focused agenda on creating a strategic plan. But again, Rachel is co-chairing along with Ashley that. So folks who have questions or concerns around these issues, and these are really good suggestions and concerns are encouraged to reach out either to diversity council or the, uh, the, the task force or both, especially since Rachel is part of uh, leadership in both. Um, let's see, I also wanna note that I know just by, by chance the interpersonal division has their idea uh, sort of group that has also try is trying to work on connecting various divisional and other unit groups on this. So there's some percolating work already um, on that front. Um, let's see, Ambar, and I think David, you wanna take this um, just because as, as, you know, as president, you might be able to speak to the current process and or um, you know, any kind of conversations we're having about this. The question from Ambar Basu, are there any structures slash systems in place for writing and sending out communication like the one sent out condemning anti-Asian violence? Okay, uh, Ambar, are you talking about uh... Uh, submitted by NCA or uh, individual members, just so I'm clear. Uh, the one that NCA sent out this morning. Okay. Oh, well, right now there's no official policy, but we are in the process of developing that policy. Uh, you might know that the NCA has a resolutions committee that uh, that meets and develops, you know, rapidly resolutions. Uh, on behalf of the association. Uh, we're finding more and more that uh, statements are becoming expected and statements are becoming necessary, which is uh, a reason why we need to decide exactly how that's uh, going to develop. Uh, in terms of developing those statements, it's, uh, you know, 
I'll give you a couple of things. Uh, what usually happens? Uh, often we're asked to sign on to statements by others. For example, the uh, American Council of Learned Societies and those members often asked us to sign on. Generally, that is uh, given to the uh, president, the current officers, uh, me, Roseanne, Waleed, and Kent, and we decide whether or not to sign on based in large part on whether or not uh, it represents, uh, for example, the, uh, the credos and the beliefs of the association and uh, the value in that particular statement. And then sometimes we, uh, we see the need to develop our own. The issue with that and something that I think the IDEA Council developed is creating those statements just as statements, uh, saying something is bad. We, we know certain things are bad. We know certain things should not be done, but we need to have action. And then that action needs to be you know, actually developed. We can't say that we are against something and then say, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea to do something? We need to develop concrete measures. And so in a roundabout way of answering your question, I hope I did uh, to a certain extent, we don't have an official process in place. It's uh, being developed probably this year as we see that need increasing. And in doing so, we want to make sure that there's action behind those statements. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so when one, one quick follow up, once the NCA uh, um, decides on a policy or like um, steps to do this, are you going to share it with everyone? Yes. Oh, definitely. Definitely share that. Thank you. Oh, Thank you're you. welcome. Well, and if I can address that really quickly, there is a process outlined um, in, I think it's in the policy, public policy section on the NCA website for requesting, for submitting ideas, requesting consideration of an issue. Um, and that's separate from the resolutions committee. Um, and so that may be another place to look for um, an outlet for members to bring forward ideas that then get considered as opposed to the top down. Um, there's also a process for a bottom up. Um, and I, I apologize, I don't have the website open and I would point you to that specific spot, but I'm sure it's under the, the public statements, public policy area um, where it outlines a process for um, submitting a request for um, a statement um, and a request for uh, looking at an issue. So. Um, I, could, I could direct you there as well. Um, yeah, I would echo that too. And, and really anyone who feels like they wanna, they, they'd like something like a statement or, or you know, again, uh, send the national office, send one of us an email. It can be pretty informal, um, but as Roseanne noted, I think there's a formal way to do it as well. But we'd love to hear more from members if they feel like there needs to be consideration of um, a statement uh, uh, and, and we'll certainly do it. But, but yeah, as, as David said, the more uh, details of the process are being um, currently refined. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I, I feel like that. Mm, am I missing? I think those may be. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any currently that are on, on the chat. Um, we have another 15 minutes or so, so happy to take additional questions. They could be broad, they could be about really, they don't have to be about things that we've discussed. They could be about other concerns you have with NCA or things you'd like to see. I have a Let's question see, if there are no others. Yeah, Michelle, yeah. Uh, the Leadership Development Committee Council, I'm not exactly sure what the ending is on it, there was a point in time where they weren't getting enough submissions to fill all of the slots that they needed to within leadership. And I've been hearing more and more from people who have submitted or volunteered or self-nominated um, who are being turned down continuously or, you know, they volunteer over the course of three years and then they just stop because they don't get any of the positions that they've ever volunteered for. Do we have a, a significant glut of people who are volunteering for leadership positions or being nominated for those positions? 
Hi, Michelle, thank you so much for that comment. Um, I'm chairing the committee this year, so I wanna take the opportunity to one, uh, 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 sh shoehorn off of your uh, question to uh, encourage anyone who wants to serve uh, in any capacity uh, on any of the committees to um, uh, send in uh, an application nomination or, or just send an email to me and um, I keep a running list and also um, encourage people to submit. So um, your question is excellent. Uh, there, I think over the years, my, you know, the four years that I've been uh, uh, working um, in the, you know, as an officer, I, I have noticed a decrease in the number of people who have submitted um, uh, nominations, self-nominations. Um, and so, but I want to be clear that there are some committees that are very, very, um, uh, popular. And so what happens is we will get 10, 15 people submitting to uh, the Teaching and Learning Council. And, uh, at, you know, but we only have, let's say, two slots available in a given year. And so we have to turn down 13, uh, potentially 13 people um, for that one uh, position. And sometimes, uh, the, of those, let's say, 13 to 15 people who, uh, or 10 or whatever, who uh, apply for that particular committee, sometimes they'll apply for another committee and then they'll actually get that one, but not get the Teaching and Learning Council one. Um, but then we have other committees, like especially some of our awards committees, where we're really trying to convince people to throw a nomination in. You know, we, we publicly put out as many notices as, as we can, but then when we have no one, the committee comes together and, and um, tries to think of somebody who would be good. And then we write, send an email and say, please you know, encourage your friends or yourself to um, uh, throw your hat in the ring. And so, so it's, it's not the same along every committee. I would say as a whole, we have fewer people uh, nominating, fewer people applying. But we do have you know, on some of these committees a lot of people annually wanting to get on it, which might explain why some people, you know, are finding that year after year they're trying, but they're not getting on the committee because you know it's a selection process. So so it just so happens that they, that they don't get on it. Um, but please, you know, encourage uh, people. Anyone who says to you they haven't gotten in on something on a committee to to uh, nominate. Uh, every year if, if possible, uh, and to encourage their friends to do the same. And I hope that they, they will be successful next time. And uh, personally, I, I sometimes joke, I got turned down by that committee so many times I ended up having to run for president just to be on something. So, so it, 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 some of them are extremely, extremely difficult to get on. We will say that's why I wasn't selected. I, I think say that's helpful, Kent and David. I my concern is that people are going to stop volunteering because they don't understand that that's the behind the scenes part of the process. And so maybe if there could at least be, even if it's a form email that's sent out to them, you know, we really encourage you to continue applying. And, and these are the places where we tend to have the largest number of applicants. And these are the places where we are almost always in need of people, if you're interested in helping in those areas. Uh, just something because there's nothing about the process that as an outsider to that council, you know anything about. That's a fantastic suggestion. I'm going to take that back and, and make sure that we do that. Thank you. Yeah. And the other thing that I would add if, uh, to hitchhike on to Kent's, Kent's um, perspective and on, on your question, Michelle, is that I think that's, you know, the, what, what Kent and I envisioned when we proposed the mentorship Leadership Development Council um, would be that you know for me that I've, it's always been um, that I look at NCA and I and I saw a lack of a of a of a coordinated kind of leadership pipeline. Again, a lot of the caucuses had those. Um, you know, as many of the divisions kind of use that leadership structure to kind of uh, sort of orient people toward leadership. But then it's kind of left up to the individuals, and there's not really a coordinated way in which we can identify people that are interested, um, as well as people who have the 
um, the experience to fill different roles or you know which roles are better for developing leadership which roles are better for people that aspire that already have some of that experience so the vision is is that that additional council will be a place that can help that process along right and so that we wouldn't be losing people but in fact we would be drawing people in in a very um, planful um, and intentional way. So, I also wanted to note, uh, you know, briefly, one of the things that we're putting together, NTA, the, the national office is putting together, is um, a list in a in a in a I guess um, user friendly way of um, all members and what they've served on in a way that allows us to see, um, you know, ways in which. I mean, there's a sense I think out there that it's NCA is a is, is a closed house, the same people doing the same things over and over and over. And we need, frankly, I need a, some data to, to get a sense for how much that's the case and where there are opportunities to diversify that, uh, that volunteerism and those contributions and et cetera. And so we're in the process of gathering the, the, those data that they are just kind of presenting it or having it in a way that can be easily seen by the committee on committees or other folks making decisions about participation so that we are, um, you know, we take that into consideration in terms of our efforts to broaden um, the base of participation in, um, in NCA's processes. Um, I'm trying to think, I think one of the things that I'm seeing in terms of comments um, and that I sort of want to echo or I want to make reiterate um, is this, you know, this real sense that we need to have a conference that takes the best of uh, what we've learned from the from the virtual. And I just wanted to sort of reiterate that there's no disagreement at all among the officers uh, that absolutely we need to have a, a conference experience moving forward that really does, uh, we do our best to incorporate um, what worked in terms of uh, virtual participation for lots of reasons, inclusivity being maybe uh, the dominant one. I think it'll make a much better conference experience over the long run, frankly, in many ways. And I think there's agreement among the officers on this. The, the, um, the, the, any hesitation that you hear or any lag that you'll see is the lag that um, uh, reflects uh, labor, technology, realities, um, and um, that, that might take some time, but we'll use you know, we have we have some some power as a large association going into hotels, and we'll use that in negotiations. Every, you know, most um, organizations are going through something similar, so I'm sure there'll be a, a shifting in you know throughout in the coming years on this. Um, uh, but also something I'm, I'm I wasn't sort of fully attuned to, I think, is the amount of the, the commitment that NCA has already put in the millions for six years. Uh, you know, based on certain agreements about number of folks in attendance, a number of rooms, number of, you know, very, you know, agreements that we've signed that undoubtedly there'll be room to change as we put pressure on hotels and other places to change, but um, that are one of the factors that we'll need to consider as we move forward in terms of how do we manage this, how do we make the changes to our contracts, um, uh, et cetera. So just to give you a sense for some of the uh, con considerations that will go into ultimately becoming a uh, convention that is uh, that takes some of the best of what we learned from virtual experience. Anyone else want to jump in on that? I just wanted to make sure that we kind of work. With that. All right. Well, it looks like I think that's the that's that's everything that's on the the chat. So I really appreciate this. this is our first time with possible various possible, you know, uncertainties related to process and technology and um, interest. It was really great to see this level of interest, to see the contributions, the ideas, the questions, and um, and so uh, much appreciated. I know you're, everyone's really busy and overwhelmed, and so the fact that 50 of you came to attend this um, is heartening. So thank you. Thank you all, it was great. Bye everyone, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.